said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath only needs to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one of them was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. That scripture begins that the hour was set in motion for Jesus to come to his glory. And the very next day, he would come into his glory as he was crucified on the cross. I just want you to envision in your mind's eye this scene. The scene is the Passover meal. This is the last meal that Jesus would have with the disciples. And it was the Passover meal that was predicted way back in Exodus that he would fulfill. He's in this quiet of this upper room where he reclines at the table with his disciples, the 12 people closest to him whom he loved best in the world. And John begins with a declaration of love, Jesus' love. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, or to the fullest extent of his love. The hour had come not only to go to his glory, but to show the fullest meaning of his love for those disciples in what he was about to do, both then at that table and over the next three days. It's in this passage that we see Jesus acting out a parable. In the other, other uh, Gospels, we hear him tell parables, but in this one, he actually enacts a parable that's designed to show what his love is about. It was as if he steps onto a stage and took on the role of an actor to portray for his audience the moral of a story. But he was no actor because he was portraying, by example, his own story. He did something that was both scandalous and shaming. It was scandalous because Jesus took off his clothes and covered himself with just a towel, stripping down his person to become like the lowliest person in the room. The people in a normal house that would be dressed that way would be a slave. Yet he's the host of the dinner party. He was no slave. The master of the household would never demean himself by washing the dirty feet of his guests. This was a lowly task of hospitality that was necessary, but the lowest person in the house would have done it. But at this intimate gathering, we see Jesus, the host, doing it. It wasn't his place to wash feet. And yet he had no slave present to do the task at hand. And it's telling, I think, to see that none of the other disciples seemed to think it was their job either. None of them would condescend to serve the other. So Jesus takes this glaring breach of hospitality to portray to them the kind of love that he had for them. It was a sacrificial, humble, humiliating even kind of love. He bends down to wash the feet of his disciples. And they were uncomfortable and they were ashamed of his actions. Just like they were ashamed of Mary's actions when she washed his feet with her hair in Bethany a few days before. You see, it just wasn't done. It wasn't right. But you know, it's the disciples who should have been ashamed of themselves. Not one of them thought to perform a simple act of hospitality for their Lord and teacher whom they said they loved. Now Peter, true to form with Peter, he takes the lead in pointing out Jesus' obvious impropriety by vehemently refusing to have Jesus wash his feet. Now Peter saw only that he was breaking social conventions and Jesus hurt his pride and, and he also compromised his own dignity in Peter's eyes. 
But Jesus was showing Peter something much deeper. Unless you allow me to wash your feet, you have no part with me, he said. Now, Peter couldn't see below the surface of the act to understand that Jesus was showing him a spiritual truth and the measure of his love for him. Now, when Peter tries to correct Jesus' actions by saying, wash my hands and my head too, Jesus said that those who have had a bath do not need to have their heads and hands washed because they're already clean. So Peter still thought Jesus was talking about washing up for dinner. But Jesus was saying that those disciples in the room, except for one, were already washed clean. Now what he's referring to is baptism. Ceremonial and spiritual washing away of sin. When a person chooses to follow Jesus and accept him as Savior, we're baptized. Everyone who accepts Jesus has been washed clean. But Jesus said that after that once and for all washing clean through baptism, the ceremonial and the spiritual baptism that we receive, those who follow him on the byways of life still need to keep turning to him to wash our feet of the grime of the sins we commit in our daily life. Though we're saved, we're not perfect, and we will still fall into sin as we try to stay in step with the Lord. We're not sin-free because we're still broken people and we live in a broken world, broken by sin. Yet we are sinless because Jesus has already imparted his righteousness to us, which has washed us clean as to the final judgment of our sins. Now Jesus asks his disciples if they understand what he's done for them, but none of them could give him an answer. He, he said to them that he's, he was setting them an example by this foot washing of what they should do for one another. Not that he meant that each time they met for a meal that they bend over and wash each other's feet. That's not what he meant at all. Rather that none of them should ever neglect to submit to the other in humble and loving service, even if that service seemed to be shameful or demeaning by human standards. By God's standards, all people are equal. We are all beloved of God. And we're called to love each other as God loves us sacrificially and giving our lives for one another. This is the example that Jesus was setting for those who would follow him. And it is the pattern for the church. Jesus said that we will be blessed if we serve one another. That is the way that we love as Jesus loves us. Just imagine what a church would look like if we all did that. A Bible scholar named Bruce Milne wrote of the important understanding of these titles here that Jesus says that the, the disciples call him Lord and Teacher. He said one of the primary expressions of our submission to Jesus as our Lord is our willingness to allow him to be our teacher. In practice, that means the unreserved submission of our minds to his truth, allowing his words, standards, values, attitudes, commandments, example, and teaching to rule our thoughts and determine our convictions. For example, Jesus' attitude of respect for and submission to the scriptures becomes normative for us. Simply said, if Jesus is not our teacher, he is not our Lord. Well, as Christians and as church together, our goal is not to think for ourselves. It is to think as Jesus thinks. And that's what the Apostle Paul wrote when he said we have the mind of Christ. Now, the mind of Christ comes in two ways. The first is through knowing the scriptures. Jesus knew the scriptures perfectly, and he kept them perfectly. He never sinned, and he never broke a commandment. In short, everything that was written before he came in what we call the Old Testament was completely upheld by Jesus in his life. And what is written in the New Testament was given through the Holy Spirit, which is the mind of Christ, to those who were either his eyewitnesses or those who recorded eyewitness testimonies. That was the standard for any of the books that went into the New Testament canon. They had to be eyewitness accounts or from eyewitnesses. So we need to be very careful today as Christians that we don't attribute to Jesus our own interpretations or imagine his approval of the current liberal theologies, which claim that because Jesus was silent on a certain subject, he had no opinion, or that he approved of different interpretations today. You see, this just doesn't hold with what the Bible says of Jesus. He honored every word of the scriptures and upheld them completely. 
The second way we have the mind of Christ is through what Jesus was alluding to for the disciples. They didn't understand what he was doing at that moment when he washed their feet, but they would understand later. And that was after his resurrection and after Pentecost when they would receive the mind of Christ, the Holy Spirit. Every believer is invested with the power, the living power of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is the one that guides us in our walk with the Lord. As I said before, we still fall into sin. But we're not blind about it because the Spirit convicts us when we sin. The Spirit guides us through Jesus' words. In John 14, Jesus says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching, and the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything I said to you. So Jesus speaks to us through his words in the scriptures, and that's how we hear his voice today. And his Holy Spirit interprets for us spiritual truths in Jesus' words. But we must also receive Christ's gift of the Holy Spirit and allow the Spirit to be active in us. You can have water baptism and still not have spiritual baptism. You have to agree in your heart and welcome the Holy Spirit in. Reading on in verses 18 through 30, we see in three of the disciples, three responses to Jesus. Love, betrayal, and denial. This is verse 18 through 30. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me, the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which one of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. And Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, ask him which one he means. So leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it into the dish. And then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into his heart. What you are about to do, Jesus told him, but no one at the meal understood this. He said, what, what you are about to do, do quickly. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was sending him out to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And it was night. Jesus had just set this example for all of them who belonged to him. But he said there was one in the room who did not belong to him. There were three disciples sitting at that table whom John mentions here in this gospel. The first is the one whom Jesus said would betray him. That's Judas Iscariot. The second is the disciple described as the one whom Jesus loved, who was reclining next to him at the table. And the third is the one who would deny him, and that was Peter. The disciple whom Jesus loved, although he's not named, is thought to be John, the writer of the gospel and the youngest of the disciples. John may have even been in his late teens. And there is some evidence also that shows that John was a cousin to Jesus on his mother's side. So if that's so, there was also a special family bond of love between him and Jesus, being the older and wiser cousin, probably taking a protective interest in John. And that is likely why John is said to be the disciple Jesus loved. Not that Jesus loved him more than the others, but he did love him in a different way because he was family as well. So young John is the one who leans over and whispers into Jesus' ear the question they all wanted to ask but didn't. Who is it, Lord, who will betray you? It was unthinkable that anyone around that table would betray the Lord and teacher. From the lover now we turn to the betrayer. Jesus references Psalm 41.9. He said, 
the one that I dip the bread for, that's the one. That's an ancient prophecy in the Psalms of this very moment. He dips the bread and he offers it to Judas. And to the others, this gesture would have looked like a singular honor of the host giving a special favor to one of the guests. That's what it might have looked like. You see, only John knew it was a signal of the betrayer. John wrote that it was at this very moment that Satan entered Judas's heart. Now, it's no surprise to Jesus that Judas betrayed him. But it says that he was deeply troubled. He wasn't surprised, but his heart was breaking. Even to the very last moment when he passed that piece of bread to Judas, Jesus was holding out the offer of salvation, the bread of life to him. But we're told that even before that night at dinner, Judas had already determined that he was going to betray him. And he would for a few pieces of silver. You see, that was Judas's weakness. His, his sin was money. Greed was his downfall. It was, as the great evangelist D.L. Moody wrote, Judas's besetting sin. A besetting sin is a pattern of sin that, if we allow it into our lives, begins to set the course of our lives. It takes over. And like the life of Judas shows, a besetting sin will draw us away from the Lord and, if unrepented, change the shape and the outcome of our lives as we are separated from the Lord forever. Judas went out and hanged himself when he realized what he had done. Judas's besetting sin was the ground of his spiritual trial, too. Jesus knew that it was only in conquering that sin that Judas could be saved. So to test him, Jesus put Judas in charge of the common purse, knowing that he regularly thieved out of it. But, you know, Judas's management of the group's money provided him with an ongoing opportunity to stop sinning, to show how much he loved the other disciples and Jesus. And Jesus never gave up hope that Judas would turn and follow him even to the very end. Even after that night, had he repented, Jesus would have welcomed him back with open arms. But this is one of the things that Jesus was doing that night at the table when he said that he was showing them the full extent of his love. His heart was wide open. He was giving every disciple the opportunity to repent and follow him. But Judas followed his own desire instead. And Jesus knew what Judas was about to do, although the others had no idea. So the Lord told him to do it quickly. Judas rose from the table, leaving behind the light of the world as he slipped out into the darkness. And that light would never again shine on Judas. And John wrote, it was night. The darkness now begins to close into the upper room as we come to the one who denied Jesus, verses 31 to 38. When he was gone, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. This is a turning point in John's gospel because Jesus is now beginning a farewell. It's not just a farewell to the disciples, but he's more like a general giving his troops their marching orders before the great battle. The general's clear of his role. He knows he's going to lead them in the battle, but he's not going to survive with them. 
He will take the brunt of the carnage alone, but they will live on and they must carry on their leader's work. Once again, Peter, of course, steps out in lead for the disciples and he speaks rashly with his typical pride and bravado. Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Now I think Jesus at this moment was looking at Peter, not reproachfully, but very tenderly. He said, will you really lay down your life for me? Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Now Peter's pride put him in danger of succumbing to a besetting sin. Peter was proud and rash. I mean, read, read the Gospels and that's the portrait you get of him. But the outcome of this prideful outburst and his subsequent behavior shows that his love for the Lord did humble his heart and he repented. And we see that at the very last chapter of John's Gospel. Peter did go on to be the leader of the Jerusalem church. But he was dogged by that sin, that, that pride and arrogance that he had. And he didn't live a long life. He did follow Jesus to the cross. Peter wanted to be crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy to be crucified as his Lord was. It was only John, the lover, who lived on into old age. And we look at the legacy of John. Look at the legacy of Judas and then Peter and John. John left us a gospel. He left us the book of Revelation. He left us three beautiful letters. John, the lover, lived on and made a big difference in the world for Jesus. We see these are the three responses to Jesus. Loved, betrayed, denied. That's what he got back from those whom he loved. How his heart must have ached and broke as he looked into their hearts that night at the table. But in these three, we still see the general responses to Jesus in the church today. Like the disciples at the table looking around at each other, we usually can't tell who's who without a word from our Lord. Who's a lover? Who's a betrayer? Who's a denier? Who will love him to the end? I don't know. As one Bible scholar wrote, this is the part of John's gospel that is a powerful and disturbing reminder of the ambiguity of life of the people of God in every age. Only Christ can truly unveil the heart as he will do on judgment day. But until then, the church is an irreducibly ambiguous company, at once both holy and profane, Embracing the servants of Christ and the servants of Satan, this must not surprise us or cause us to stumble. The presence of Judas among the visible co company of disciples throughout the course of Jesus' three-year ministry did not prevent the completion of his purpose, nor the coming of the Spirit, nor the witness of the apostles, nor the going of Jesus out into the world through them. And it need not and it must not prevent it now. Broken and flawed and sinful as we are, Jesus has given us who would be the church a commandment that is not optional. We must love one another as Jesus loved us in humility and sacrifice and putting the good of the other above our own. Even knowing that we too will be betrayed and denied. But above all, we will be loved also by some. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you who are our Lord and our teacher and our savior, we who are flawed and broken and sinful, who really don't know what true love is, have no choice but to throw ourselves at the foot of your throne of grace and beg you for your great mercy to show us how to love one another through the power of your love and the life of your Holy Spirit in us. Lord, we beseech you now to show us how to love. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon this body, Lord. For those who have received your spirit, I ask for a powerful renewal of that flow of love through them. For those who have not 
allowed your spirit in, I pray, Lord, that you would soften the heart and open it up, that your spirit may come in. For those who have no understanding or don't believe that it's really something that's needed for them, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would gently and persuasively show them his life and that it could be theirs. They had a love for God and a love for their families and a love for freedom that brought them to this world. And, 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 and William Bradford exemplifies that. I wish, I wish they had left us some kind of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a training manual, some kind of a, a secret sauce recipe card that we could pick up and go, all right, here's what it is, here's what we do. What do we do? How do we get back to that? You now, when uh, the children of Israel going into the Promised Land, they crossed the Jordan River and God stood it on in and they walked across. And before the waters stopped parting, God told them to take 12 stones from the bottom of the river and put it up on the top of Mount Gilgal and make a monument. So that when your children ask, what are these stones? They will be able, you'll be able to tell them, this is where God parted the sea. And that's what the pilgrims left us. They left us a monument that not only gives tribute to what was accomplished here, but it gives us a specific strategy, a breakout of a blueprint of if we would ever forget what made America great, what made us free, we can go back and follow that strategy and it's right up on a hill a half mile from here. Right here? Right here. It's 180 tons of solid granite. It's the largest granite monument in America, and it's hidden on a hilltop overlooking Plymouth in a residential neighborhood. I've never heard of this. Hardly anybody in America knows about it, and yet the people of America put this together over a 70-year period, paid for by the Congress, paid for by the state legislature in Massachusetts, as a strategy laid out, you call it the Matrix of Liberty, that was given to us by the forefathers, by the pilgrims. And they, those 130 years ago, when they built this, wanted to leave this behind for us. So that if we would ever forget how liberty is built, we would know what to do to regain it. This is how they did it. This is how they did it. Now, if, if somebody else wants to try another way, which is what's happening today in America, we're trying a thousand ways to turn America around, but this is the way it was done. So this is it, the only successful strategy of liberty that has ever been carried out in the history of mankind. Well, let's walk through it. And yeah, this, yeah. We're, let's we're, take this strategy apart. What does this mean? What are they trying to tell us here? So where do you, where do you well, start? Well, her name is Faith. It says so right there. And she is pointing her finger to heaven. Why? For God is. For God is, because her faith is in the God of the Bible in Jesus Christ. They knew that the only faith that could bring true liberty was a faith in the one true God and his Bible. And you see a Bible there, an open Bible. It's a Geneva Bible. The pages are opened up, which meant that they read it. And as they read it, and as they had faith in God, he gave them wisdom. That's why you see the star on her forehead. She's given wisdom to know how to live in this world. And all of the rest of these statues, each one weighing almost 20 tons, is tied to faith, because without faith, it falls apart. And that's the beginning of it all. <laughs> 